We're going to go on to our next uh, session now, and it's going to be on uh, frameworks, models, and experiences for inclusive research. And I'm delighted to hand over to Graham Martin, who's Director of Research at this Institute. Graham, it's all yours. Thanks, Vivian. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so the contribution of diversity of perspectives to the richness of knowledge and the quality of decision making at all sorts of levels is something that's now widely acknowledged and research itself is no exception to that. Um, the importance of securing diverse contributions to research teams is something that funders, universities and research teams alike now recognise. There's various traditions around this. So we have things like co-production and user-led research that blur the traditional boundaries between the producers and the beneficiaries of research knowledge. And we've also seen a long history of groups like mental health service users who've been instrumental in securing influence for themselves and broadening the imagination, the scope and the creativity of health services research. Uh, frameworks and models for inclusion can help to make research more inclusive, and there's a lot of them around, um, but what we want to explore in this session is how researchers can best make use of those frameworks, best make use of different approaches and best access different forms of knowledge, what the limitations of those kinds of resources might be in maximising the inclusivity and the quality of research, and the question also of how um, researchers, patients, carers, healthcare staff can best make use of different perspectives. Sometimes they're complementary, sometimes they're conflicting. How can we draw on them to enrich research and gain the greatest knowledge we can about how to improve healthcare? So we're gonna start the session with a couple of videos. Uh, first of all, Tom Shakespeare, Professor of Disability Research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine will be speaking. And then we'll hear from Graham Pullin, who is Professor of Design and Making at the University of Dundee and who is also at this Institute Fellow. So my name's Tom Shakespeare, and I've spent about 35 years doing uh, disability research. That is research with a wide range of people uh, affected by health conditions. Um, and for me, that's pretty broad. It includes people with uh, research growth, people with um, mental health issues, uh, people with visual impairment, hearing impairment, uh, wheelchair users, and all the rest of it. So it's very, very broad. Um, and I think that similarly, the way that we develop inclusive research models has to be broad because in the lives of people I've talked to, uh, they're affected by, as it were, biological things. That is to say, having dementia or multiple sclerosis or achondroplasia or whatever else it might be. So there is a level of, of medical issue, which we think I, I think we need to attend to because it is relevant to people's a life experience, particularly when it pertains to pain and frailty and other forms of uh, restriction. Um, there's also obviously a whole layer of environmental effects. That is to say where you live. Um, very simply, I live in London. I live in South London. Why? Because it's largely flat. I uh, thought of going for a job in Bristol. No, it's a gorge. Um, and similarly in international work, People who live in Cameroon have a lot harder time with their wheelchairs or getting about than people who live in, in London or in Sydney or somewhere else. I can get on any bus, for example, I can get about. So there's a level of, of the environment, not just the physical environment that I've mentioned, but also the extent to which reasonable accommodation is supported, the extent to which people are happy for you to be different. So physical, biological, environmental. And then of course, there's a level of psychological. Um, so um, how might you be impacted by having an impairment or living in a society which discriminates against people with that sort of impairment? Um, maybe there's some biological dimension of your impairment, maybe not, but you might be a woman, you might be from a minority population, you might be excluded, or you, your dog might have died. There's all sorts of reasons why you personally might have um, emotional or psychological issues. And then of course, there's a whole realm of social issues, uh, the extent to which your country has a anti-discrimination framework for dealing with disability and mental health, um, the extent to which your country has ratified the UN Convention on the, Lives of, of the Rights of People with Disabilities. All of these dimensions of 
uh, uh, um, uh, social uh, implications of disability, mental health, chronic illness will have a big uh, effect. Um, what welfare payments are available? Um, what return to work arrangements are available? All of these things. So you can see why I say that disability, uh, mental health, the whole range of, 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 of health issues is multifactorial. And I think that any research with people which aims to be inclusive has to understand those range of issues which might pertain. Reducing it simply to the medical seems to me ridiculous. I could say quite accurately that I have a G2A transposition at 0.38 to my FGFR3 gene, but it wouldn't mean much to you. But I could tell you about my class, gender, life experience, health conditions for sure, but it's all part of that wider picture. So multifactorial, but secondly, I think inclusive research has to hear from lived experience. I've told you quite a lot about myself so far, and most people will talk about themselves as what they know best. And so I think when we understand, for example, how people experience barriers, or how people experience their health condition, or how people experience society, then listening to them, who are the best experts on their own lives, is really important. And you know, I see doctors from time to time. If I'm lucky, I see my GP for 10 minutes. If I'm lucky, I see the uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon for 15 minutes, but it's not for long. And if you consider that a couple of times a year within the framework of 365 days, 24 hours a day, you can see that the person who really knows about the impacts of impairment on their life is the person with the health condition. Now, that expertise by experience doesn't mean that they know everything there is to know. Of course not. I don't know whether it's better to go for surgery for nerve root problems that I have or not. But the orthopedic surgeon has seen a lot of cases and can say, in your case, yes, or in your case, no. And I'm going to listen to them. I might get a second opinion, but I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. And similarly, not being a psychiatrist not being a neurologist, not being a respiratory medicine specialist, means that I will want to work in partnership with those people. And for example, um, uh, I did a project, and this is an example of commission research, um, with the Restricted Growth Association, which is funded by the Big Lottery Fund. And who did I partner with? Well, obviously, the Restricted Growth Association, people living with the experience, but also with a geneticist because he was an expert in skeletal dysplasia. He could understand what health issues people were reporting. And between us, he was dealing mainly with the health issues. I was dealing mainly with the social issues. We managed to cover the whole area that people talked about, their pain, their limitation, mobility issues, but also their unemployment, their education issues, their family issues. And together, we were able to turn those lived experiences of the, of the more than 80 people we talked to into an account which gave justice to the complexity, the richness of their lives. Now, that commission research uh, was interesting uh, because it was commissioned by an organization that didn't have a lot of experience of, um, of research. And that was one of the reasons that the Big Lottery Fund, as it was called at the time, funded this sort of research. They wanted it to be managed by people with lived experience, people from the voluntary community sector, and then done by um, academics. And in my case, I was an academic who shared the experience we were researching, which was useful, but was also potentially problematic because obviously when it comes to more than 80 people's accounts, they might not be the same as mine. It's true, I could recognize the truth of what they were saying, and I could say, oh, we ought to attend to this, but I mustn't let my own personal experience cloud my objectivity when we're generalizing from a much bigger sample of people with uh, skeletal dysplasia. And also it's potentially problematic because the voluntary organization in this case had never managed a research project before. So this was new to them. So there's a risk that we told them you know, how to do it, which would be wrong. And there's also an opposite risk that they told us how to do it. 
And for example, I remember we had some money left over and we wanted to go and report our findings at a conference. And that's a legitimate use of research expenses. But no, it was felt by the Research Grad Association we were not going to get a freebie. We were not going to go to a conference and therefore they didn't present their findings. Now, I think that was a shame. Um, and it arose from the feeling of the research managers, the voluntary organization, that you academics, you're always trying on a freebie. Really, we weren't. We wanted more people to know what we found. And it would have been useful, yes, to us, but most importantly, to them. As it was, we did a report, we did a launch, we did about three academic papers. It was widely understood and reported, but it could have been better. And I think being able to present it academically could have been helpful. I'll give you a second example um, of, in this case, it's co-production, because it's true that the uh, uh, research growth research was managed by an organization, but it, it, the, the, the data collection was done by a non-disabled woman. I did a little bit, mostly it was done by a non-disabled woman. The example I'm gonna give you of what I call, what we call succeed, um, which is one of those clever acronyms, and it's to do with um, research into psychosis in uh, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria. And it's about trying to build co-production in mental health research, because there's very little in Africa. Um, and when we did a systematic review, it was found that only four papers had been published from a co-production perspective in Africa. So it's very important that we did this. Um, however, I think it divides by academics. It's not user led. Um, and if you, we, we do have um, peer researchers, we do have uh, people with mental health uh, experience collecting the data, managing the data, disseminating the data, developing the um, MOOC, a massive open online course, and similar uh, uh, uptake and dissemination activities. So that's really good but I think we could do better. I think next time we should have it devised by users. Um, we do hope we're meeting what they perceive to be their needs, but we could be more um, uh, attentive, I think. Um, but as a result of this Succeed project, there will be a big uptick in um, African mental health co-produced research, which is very good and, and not for time. Um, I want to give you two more examples of user-led research. And the first one is um, uh, 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 the DRILL program. DRILL stands for Disability Research in Independent Living and Learning. And so it was a five-year uh, program of research managed by um, Disability Rights UK and run in UK between 2015 and 2020. And the aim of the project was to create a body of work which explored some of the issues facing disabled people and how they might be resolved. And each of the projects, and it was tried very hard to make them geographically representative and to look at different areas of disability, uh, different health conditions broadly. Um, each of them was commissioned by disabled people's organizations themselves, but often, usually they were collaborating with a group or a, an academic partner or a, re, a, a traditional researcher who gathered the data. Um, but it was a really good innovation. And my role was merely to be uh, one of the advisors. And we uh, allocated the money. Uh, I chaired the panel in, in the UK, which said, this is worth funding, this is not. And it was really difficult because of course people had put forward uh, what they were really most passionate about. And in each case, we had to look very carefully. Was this generated by the academics? No, no, no. Or was this generated by the, di the disability organization? And in those cases, we we're far more likely uh, to fund it. So not necessarily doing research, but certainly managing, running, developing, and uh, uh, calling for the research. The second example is even better. And it's a network called um, the Dementia Inquiries. And it is run by uh, a, a, a network called uh, DEEP. And it's all to do with local projects, local um, activities of people with dementia 
uh, addressing their priorities. And they're not turning around and getting people like me, people without dementia, to do the research. They're doing the research themselves. So it's really interesting to support them to see how local groups um, can uh, gather uh, information. For example, about admiral nurses or about whether it's better for people with dementia to live on their own or to live with a care partner and so forth. There's lots of them. Um, there's something like eight to 10 projects run by local deep groups uh, addressing priorities of people with dementia themselves and gathering the data themselves. So I think, you know, if people diagnosed with dementia can do this, then I think we can all do this. We can all get it right. And what's quite interesting in terms of the folk with dementia, one of the big barriers to them doing this sorts of inclusive research is the ethics uh, committee uh, apparatus. It's not easy for people to, to use uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the ethics committee process. It's meant to protect people with lived experience. And for example, people with dementia might be prominent among those, but the effects, you know, it may or may not protect people, but it certainly is a hindrance. It's very complicated to get through an ethics review. And they might have blanket ideas that people with dementia are vulnerable and shouldn't do research or are at risk in research. And the dementia pioneers have pioneered a much simpler ethics evaluation. So all their projects have gone through an ethics uh, review, but not always the uh, local research ethics committee process. And I, I think that they are all ethical, they are all very carefully done, um, and we might need to have a different structure if we're to enable um, inclusive research really to take place. So let me finish by talking about some of the uh, uh, priorities. Um, I've got three Ps really, uh, priorities, protection and people. So in terms of priorities, I don't think that uh, just because you are a user-controlled organization, you always get it right. Remember that uh, experience where we weren't uh, sent off to a, um, a conference because it was felt just to be a freebie for academics and we don't want one of those. We'll give them money back. We're not going to spend it. I'm not sure that lay people always get it right. Um, I, I'm not even sure that the priorities of, for example, disability rights organizations are always correct. If you look at disability studies in the UK, it had neglected rehabilitation. Now, not all disabled people go through rehabilitation, but it's really important. So that is a whole area we've tried to promote research in because it was underdeveloped. Um, let me say something about, uh, well, protection, I think I've mentioned. It's fear of the vulnerability of people with lived experience that comes through ethics committees. So I think we have to do better to look at that. And finally, um, what about people? Um, are we trying to turn lay people into researchers? Remember, it takes three years to do a PhD. There's a lot of technical expertise. I don't think I need lay people to be researchers all the time. I think there's also a question about who is paid and who is volunteering. So I think we need to be equitable. We, we need to reimburse people properly, uh, even if we don't turn them into researchers. Um, and finally, I want to say that often lay researchers or people with lived experience are not seen as being representative. And this has always been a problem for me. And I went to Cambridge, I went, I've got a PhD and yeah, I'm not representative. And I say that, but it's also what is to said to the dementia pioneers. And they are, are representative. They're just like everybody else, but they're told that they're not. And uh, re recently we launched Diane Rose's book. Diane Rose is a person with mental health uh, experience who, who's experienced the, the, the uh, uh, mental illness. And she is also not seen as ha being representative. So I think it's always possible to say that the disability or the mental health advocates are not representative of the people uh, with whom they research. But I think that's a, a, a negative, a unnecessary uh, um, response. What we should be looking at is empowering more people so that more people can do research in the future. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Graham Pullen. 
I'm a This Institute Senior Fellow and Professor of Design and Disability at the University of Dundee in Scotland. Today I'm talking about framing new conversations between healthcare, disability and culture. A fuller title might be picturing and framing new conversations because our research is situated in an art college and we use visual methods as a mode of inquiry and also to engage diverse audiences. We founded an interdisciplinary research group, Studio Ordinary, which is a collective of disabled and non-disabled researchers, disability studies scholars and designers. This research has its roots in conversations with people about prosthetics, but we think it might have broader relevance. It's a truism that in shared decision-making, a successful outcome depends on a person's values. But Corinne Hutton reflects that the aesthetics of her prosthetic hands and feet were an afterthought. There was no discussion into it, she said. Yet the design of a prosthetic hand, including whether it imitates a human limb or not, can change what it means to wear a prosthesis in the first place. People have diverse and nuanced stances about their own disability, and therefore about any healthcare relating to this. So the first instance of picturing and framing new conversations involves new visual tools to help people to think through alternative aesthetic futures and healthcare decisions. At the beginning of my fellowship, we created an exhibition at the V&A in Dundee, exploring disability and design that attracted over 100,000 visitors. Some 7,500 of these chose to complete a participatory activity. This was entitled Hand of You, in which visitors were invited to choose one of several currently available prosthetic hands. This could be a robotic hand, as shown here, increasingly worn with no covering. It could be a cosmetic hand that imitates a human hand, but might still contain a working mechanism. Or it could be choosing to wear no prosthesis at all as a conscious decision, rather than being seen as non-compliance. The collage sheets were visually rich, involving handwritten annotation. Personalities and identities really came across. Thematic analysis revealed diversity not only in people's choices, but also in the values behind those choices, and sometimes in the dilemmas that they felt. This richness is in stark contrast with current patient reported outcome measures, for example which in seeking quantitative evidence can be simplistic. The insights suggest that we might need new tools to support more nuanced communication between clinicians and patients. Participants included people with limb difference amongst a public audience, but also other patients and healthcare professionals, suggesting a broader application. And with this in mind, and together with applied philosopher Alan Cribb, we've authored a recent paper in BMJ Integrated Healthcare Journal, suggesting a role for visual tools in catalyzing new conversations in shared decision making. Just those conversations that Corinne Hutton never got to have. The second instance of picturing and framing new conversations involves using visual methods to suggest new influences being brought into healthcare improvement. It started with an exploratory mapping of individuals and domains in relation to healthcare and evolved into a wider landscape of healthcare, disability and culture. And these are not just academic disciplines, it also involved creative practices and importantly lived experiences. Surprisingly or unsurprisingly, the middle of the map was quite empty. It was difficult to identify individuals who already deeply combined healthcare, disability and culture in some way. And I consider Tom to be a notable exception. 
yet it suggested bridging this gap by mediating new conversations between individuals connected to healthcare improvement and others who could bring contrasting and perhaps constructively critical perspectives. In a time of COVID, this became a series of online conversations edited by filmmaker Jared Schiller into videos that will shortly be available through the This Institute website. Transcripts are included in a fellowship report discussing prosthetics, aesthetics, and ethics, also shortly to be available through the This Institute website. But in the meantime, here are some excerpts. Conversation five was between prosthetist Sarah Day and disability studies scholar, David Serlin, and they discussed gender and prosthetics. In this one minute extract, Day and Serlin are talking about the issue of perceived ownership of a prosthesis. I don't believe that we really cover the, the topic of ownership um, properly. And when if you were to discuss ownership with a lot of clinicians, you'd probably it'd probably be, well, who paid for the limb? You know, they own it. So for example, maybe the NHS owns the, owns the prosthesis. So they're actually talking about who physically owns it rather than who's, who it belongs to. And um, I've been in clinic where people have said, no, you, you can't touch that because you don't own it. Well, yeah, of course I own it. I, I use it every single day. Um, so, so there's those kind of um, technical issues that, that perhaps need to be sorted as well to, to allow someone to, to take it as theirs and, and um, as part of them. I suppose that I think to to kind of build on what you're saying, part of this also is a, is is it, I guess it comes in education and training of the prosthetist, but then also is someone who wears slash uses uh, has made for them a prosthetic, are they a patient? Conversation four was between the health psychologist Maggie Donovan Hall and artist and prosthetics wearer. Andrew Gannon, who discussed ableism and aesthetics. In this one minute extract, Donovan Hall and Gannon are exploring the challenges of representing design issues within patient reported outcome measures. To understand that there is kind of like actual physical kind of um, change happening to my body because of the way that I have to adapt to the world. And that's, that seems within the realms of what the NHS should understand. So then to expect it to understand how design maps onto this mm. as well mm. is sort of asking, I, I don't know whether it's asking too much of them. I understand why it's not a priority on those questionnaires maybe. I think when we look at, we look at any type of um, patient reported outcome measure, um, it's very, it's very hard to do. And I think, I think it, you know, taken a really patient-centred approach. People are having to, to, to measure things to show the value of a service. We do need to be able to do it. Um, and I think patient-reported outcome measures are, are, are a very complex and problematic area in all areas of healthcare and rehabilitation. Conversation three was between disability researcher Tom Shakespeare and occupational therapist Natasha Layton who discussed rehabilitation and disabled expertise. In this one minute extract, Shakespeare and Leighton are reflecting on the relationship between disability studies and rehabilitation sciences. Department, and um, I have a PhD student who's just finishing on a project called Rights-Based Rehabilitation, which ah. is saying, how can we bring together rehabilitation sciences and disability studies, which have really not spoken to each other very much. They have not. In, in, in disability studies, traditionally, we've think, thought of as rehabilitation as evil exercise of power over poor disabled people, which is not true. And in rehabilitation sciences, I don't think they've always been very strong on the voice of disabled mm. people, mm. partnership with disabled people. I wonder if um, when we do things like say, oh, of course, you know, the consumer voice needs to be there. And so we have a consumer engagement panel or whatever. Um, and then you can tick off your client-centred practice checklist. 
I still don't think it's quite there. I'm not seeing people directing the research or um, setting the hospital priority agenda. And conversation six was between bioethicist Rosemary Garland Thompson and designer and prosthetics wearer Caitlin McMullen, who discussed choices and ethics. In this two minute extract, Garland Thompson and McMullen are talking about the relationship between prosthetist and wearer and how this is framed. I actually, um, I changed prosthetist because I didn't get along with one, <laughs> the one who thought that um, a foam casing would be appropriate for me. I, I thought that we wouldn't see eye to eye, so I asked to change. Um, and the person that I'm with now, I feel like, you know, we've had conversations about what I do and I feel like she knows me better and she wants, she does mainly think about functionality. She doesn't mind when I say that something's not right or I don't like the look of something or I think that she could have made a mistake with this. There's, I think there's ways to go about She's also designed, like, she's made it and she wants to make the perfect leg for me, but um, it's, it's a collaboration. It's, a, it's about the two of us creating it, and I think that needs to be thought about in a kind of healthcare setting, um, is that they're not just making an object for you, they're, you're, they're making it with you. Mm -hmm. My long work has been as a um, scholar and researcher in the area of literary studies and cultural studies. So I'm attentive, I mean, that's been my work in part, to be attentive to cultural narratives of disability. Thank you for listening. And I would value your thoughts and advice for how this research might most valuably contribute to healthcare improvement. And if you'd like a printed copy of the report, then please email me at g.pullin at dundee.ac.uk. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed those videos. Um, now, we arranged a panel discussion to follow those presentations. Uh, unfortunately, due to the rearranging of the day to today, bringing it forward, uh, Tom himself is unable to attend, although he has recorded a, a video of response, which we'll see in a short while. Um, also unable to attend, unfortunately, is Stella O'Brien, who is a researcher and patient representative. She has, though, provided her thoughts, and I'll share some of those in a minute. I'm very glad to say that we do have Graham himself uh, on the panel and also joining us is Doreen Tembo, who's Senior Research Manager for Global Health and Community Engagement and Involvement Lead at the uh, National Institute for Health Research, sorry, National Institute for Health and Care Research uh, Coordinating Centre. So uh, welcome to both of you. Something that occurred to both me and Stella, and we discussed this a little bit by email in advance, uh, when we watched the videos was around some of the power imbalances that can arise in these collaborative um, research endeavours. And of course, there's power imbalances there to start with, but it's perhaps easier to hide them when you've got one group that is researchers and another group uh, that is participants. It's easier not to talk to them and, and to hide them in the process. But when both groups are part of the research production process explicitly, um, those power imbalances perhaps become a bit more um, visible. And Stella has been involved uh, in research looking at this on a global health scale. Um, and in global health, of course, there are lots of you know, truly international, transnational research efforts uh, involving researchers from high-income countries, researchers from, from low-income countries, but often the rewards of that research in terms of who holds the funding, who gets the prestigious authorship positions, who's an author on the papers at all, um, is distributed unequally. So they go, as you might expect, to the researchers in high income settings, uh, whilst the researchers in low income countries who do work that's really important to the production of research from you know, infrastructural development through data collection, cleaning data, some of the analysis, that work is ascribed lower value. And I wonder, and, and Stella was wondering as well, if we run the risk of 
reproducing those structures of exploitation um, in uh, research that involves service users, members of the public, others as co-researchers. So just as field workers in low-income countries, their contributions are, are devalued, do we run the same risk of doing the same with, with disabled people who provide ideas to funders that are then harvested by professional researchers or contributors to research approaches who might miss out on, on recognition in authorship lists? Um, can I put that um, those thoughts to you, first of all, Doreen, as a, as a uh, commissioner, among other things, of, of research? Yeah, I mean, you, you raise a lot of pertinent points. Um, and I think especially thinking about uh, actually both um, healthcare organization and uh, delivery and the um, uh, engagement and involvement um, of uh, people that might be uh, marginalized because of um, uh, issues such as uh, disability or, or the fact that perhaps there are minorities or the other groups in fact that um, Tom spoke about. Uh, both for service delivery and for research, the concept of co-production um, is quite a useful concept in terms of leveling um, that playing field and making sure that power is shared within the process, whether it's um, co-designing the um, care pathway um, that you might receive um, as a service user, as a patient, or um, being involved in research, um, again, as a service user representative, a patient or a community member, or somebody that perhaps is connecting the community to researchers. So um, there are different ways that you can, of course, involve and engage the community. Um, there's a whole spectrum. You know, it can be very light touch, very disempowering in terms of perhaps just sharing information with them, all the way through to um, that partnership with communities, treating um, everyone as equals. And then at the very extreme, um, again, this came out from Tom's talk, user-led research, um, where, where the community controls the research and perhaps brings the researcher into that process. Again, um, something that came out in Tom's talk. So uh, what we find useful from an NIHR perspective um, is co-production and the key principles uh, for co-production from our perspective is sharing that power where you make sure that the research is adaptable and localized to the context that you're carrying out the research um, in and also that you have that very active involvement um, and participation of the community where they're actually involved in decision making um, throughout the whole process um, and they're not being brought in at the end again something that came out um, in Tom's uh, uh, talk um, and also building and maintaining relationships so that you're not just going in, getting what you want from people and leaving once you've kind of got um, the input that you need from the community, but instead you actually work to build capacity, um, build on skills that are already um, existing, have that two-way communication with the community to actually find out what capacity they would actually like um, to, be, uh, to be built up um, from a community and individual perspective. And also, really respecting all perspectives of the research team, uh, whether that be academic knowledge or lived experience. And finally, um, respecting the different types of knowledge that are present, um, and this came out uh, very much, I think, in Graham's talk, where um, there is no hierarchy um, in the knowledge and you value that lived experience, the qualitative experience that 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 very much kind of guides um, how uh, we interact with communities, as well as that more quantitative um, uh, angle, such as the the uh, kind of more biomedical and quantitative um, sciences as well. Thanks, Story and, and Graham. I can see you've got your hands up. Um, I, I wonder if you could add your perspectives here, particularly in terms of that, that point that Dorian's just made about the way different forms of knowledge are or aren't valued. Clearly, different forms of academic uh, knowledge have different values attached to them. Um, how, how do we ensure that the, the different perspectives that you've covered in your work, for example, are given appropriate? Um, value. Yeah, thank you. I think there are so many important issues wrapped up in this, and I agree with everything that Doreen's just said. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's important to transcend interdisciplinary research, as you say, and and to blur the boundaries between research and practice, and and research knowledge and lived experience. Um, and I think, I think we have a you know as a 
as a research studio of disabled and non-disabled researchers, I think we have a very good experience on co-design. Um, I think we're still on a journey though in terms of what, what could genuinely be called co-research and to position our um, often quite specific to a project, people with lived disabled experience as, as co-researchers. Um, Tom made some brilliant points about how that meshes or fails to mesh with the ethical um, approval process, um, which I think puts more onus on protecting what it sees as um, or assumes to be vulnerable groups than it does on the ethics of the principle of nothing about us without us. Um, and we need to see those two in, and again, in equal balance, I think. Um, and here in Dundee, one of the things we're doing in the, you know, on that journey is we're, um, we're framing our relationships with disabled people who are external to the studio, but we're working with on a project. Um, obviously, certainly not as subjects, but as mentors. And that's a, that's a phrase we've inherited from um, a wonderful man called Colin Portnuff, who had complex communication needs and spoke very eloquently to the, um, to the domain of augmentative and alternative communication about how better the research community could engage with people with lived experience of the of the technologies they were they were developing. Thanks, Graham. And another excellent little phrase there: not subjects, but mentors. I think that's another one that people will be taking away. Well, that's a very neat cue, almost as if we planned it for Tom's response video. So uh, let's have a watch and a listen of that now. I really like Graham's uh, video that he's done, and uh, I look forward. I'm sure there'll be a great discussion. Um, from it, I just want to highlight a couple of things. Um, first, I think there should be a real collaboration between expert by uh, profession and expert by experience in assistive devices of all kinds. Um, and I've experienced that myself. Um, I, I'm not an orthotist. I'm not um, a wheelchair technician. Um, I'm not an OT. I don't know what is available and what is best for somebody with, um, in my case, L2 paralysis and uh, achondroplasia. I've got short arms. Uh, but I do have a lifetime experience of that. And so the collaboration brings that wide knowledge of the professional and that deep knowledge of the person with disability, really hopefully to design something that is best for them. And frequently that has been the case. Uh, it hasn't always been the case. Um, I remember talking to wheelchair technicians and saying, you know, I have short arms, therefore I need large wheels, and there is a problem with the distance between my arm and the wheel. And they go, oh yeah, they measure up and all the rest of it. And the wheelchair comes back and it's not suitable because they didn't listen to me and they didn't realise they had short arms and they have to remake it and put on a, a bigger wheels or whatever it might be. So it's not infallible expertise by profession um, and it does have to be supplemented by what le people living with the uh, uh, disability know. But it should be a collaboration, it should be a real partnership. And the second thing that I want to re-emphasise, if you like, is that disability is very variable. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a physical impairment and a functional capacity. It's uh, an environment. Um, you know, my lovely little front wheel caster on the wheelchair uh, is great for London, hopeless for Uganda, where there are potholes. And I just would pitch out, I need a motivation wheelchair, a big front wheel wheelchair. Um, the, the environment is really important. So the impairment, the environment, um, but also all impairments have a psychological dimension, even if you don't have uh, uh, mental health issues. Um, and your motivation, your uh, 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 understanding, your uh, awareness, your uh, personal self-esteem is vital to the way that as a disabled person you flourish. And of course, that's not, as it were, biological. It's not given by God. It is to do with the way you're treated. I am a successful white middle class man. And of course, all of that contributes to my feeling that I'm all right. A lot of disabled people do not feel like that uh, because they've been told they're not like that. Uh, it's not to do with biology, it's to do with being poor or being a woman or being a, man, a member of a minority or being excluded. All of those contribute to your feelings. So environment, biology, uh, 
uh, psychology, and of course, the way that your society regards people like you. And that's very different in terms of the legal system, the provision of services, all the rest of it in different settings. So um, it, it's different here too. I've been in uh, Newcastle, Norwich, London. It's all been different. Um, and that's within the NHS. That's within the same uh, system. Therefore, of course, it varies. And I think sensitivity to that, to the multifactorial nature of disability, um, is really important. It's not us and them. It's not medical model and social model. It's more complicated than that, which is how I've made a living for the last 30 years. Thank you very much. Thanks to Tom for recording uh, that response video. And I think what that really drives home in particular is, is, is the point about intersectionality, the, the, the point that we cannot homogenize any one group on the basis of a particular characteristic. Actually, things are gonna be different for different people, which of course complicates the question of representativeness. Although as, as Tom was saying in his earlier video, it's very easy to chastise or marginalize people because they're not quote unquote representative. I'd also like to bring in um, another point that Stella made at this point. So Stella was um, drew our attention in particular to patient-led innovation and research. And she gave the example in particular of research around long COVID and the role that patients have played in collecting their own data, organizing as a peer group, campaigning and seeking to stimulate research. And she gives the example of the patient-led research collaborative on long COVID, which is made up of long COVID patients who are also researchers from a very wide range of disciplinary backgrounds. That group has published various uh, papers itself and it's developed collaborations with multiple universities, uh, including, for example, work challenging existing uh, patient reported outcome measures and trying to develop new ones that are more suitable for people with long COVID. So turning to, to Graham again, that kind of dual role um, exemplified in that uh, patient-led research collaborative on long COVID, people using their identity as patients and as researchers, it seems to exemplify the integration of multiple perspectives, that middle triangle that was underpopulated uh, in, in your framework. And I, I guess it kind of feels like it's one possible way of realizing that, uh, that dialogue, integration of perspectives. Is that what you had in mind? And what else can we gain from creating those dialogues? What comes next after your research? That's a nice question. Um, and I think, I think having having said that Tom was unusual at being somewhere towards the center of the triangle, um, I can I can see that that question arises. I think one observation I had was that when when we set up these conversations across the the empty quarter in the middle of the triangle, if you like, um, I, I was quite concerned that they might need some mediation because of how diverse the perspectives might be. Um, and, you know, and, and also because of, I think there was a, a feeling, particularly amongst those who weren't associated with healthcare, um, an, an uncertainty as to whether they had anything valu valuable to contribute at all, you know, people from the eyewear or fashion industries, for example. Um, and what I found in those conversations, um, you know, just a few of them, but, but they, they were very consistent, was that there was a real energy on both sides and a real um, a real wish to engage. And the conversations, you know, far from being stilted and needing a lot of management from me, um, took off immediately. And, and, and it was the filmmaker and I, Jared Schiller, who had to come in and stop them after about 90 minutes in each case, because we'd, we'd um, you know, everyone had run out of time. Um, so I think, I don't think people need to all meet in the middle of the triangle. I think we need to just create some, some um, communication channels across it. I mean, I think if that happens, of course, we'll learn from each other and, and we'll all move um, towards each other's positions or at least have far more awareness of them. Um, but I think just you know, having conversations as diverse as possible um, would be my priority. Thank you. Doreen, um, turning to you, we're slight, starting to run out of time. I don't think we've had any questions from the audience, but we'll try and fit one in at the end if we do get one. Um, from your perspective, what kind of collaboration between patients or service users and professional researchers looks ideal? What are the, what are the key characteristics you look for in that kind of collaboration? Um, I, I think a key characteristic um, is really where the research team is treating the um, 
representatives, the service users as equals. So um, as a funder, for example, um, both in our um, national work and international work, we are um, very, very uh, supportive um, of the involvement of service users. So we, for example, mandate it um, as part of our uh, criteria for actually assessing whether we award funding to teams. Uh, it's very central because we recognize that you can fund some fantastic science, but if it's not actually created for that group, similar to what Tom said about the wheelchair, you know, wheelchairs are not cheap, but a whole wheelchair was potentially wasted and not used by the service user because the science, the measurements, you know, took precedence over what the service user needed. So um, in a similar vein, we have examples of multi-million, you know, dollar projects that have failed because the community was not consulted. It wasn't adapted. It wasn't culturally um, uh, uh, acceptable, you know, the interventions that were produced. So we know that um, the involvement of communities is a central pillar um, to making research and service provision work as well. Thank you, Doreen. Um, well, we are starting to run out of time, so I don't think we've um, got time for much more discussion. I think there's been some lively discussion uh, in the chat. For example, again, sort of, I suppose, reinforcing the point that people are different and that we can very easily um, uh, characterise or caricature people according to um, the particular perspective that we've selected them for. And, you know, some very strong reminders in there, including around conflict, disagreement within uh, participation groups, that that isn't always the case. So uh, I think um, much to much to learn from existing frameworks, much also to be done in practice to ensure that we're inclusive, that we make the most of those uh, disagreements and that we don't uh, risk suppressing views because they're not the right ones, quote unquote. That's all that we've got time for from this session. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you also to Tom and Stella for their contributions. I will hand back over to Vivian now.